Welcome to Standing in the Sunlight with Cynthia Rose. We are all on an ever-unfolding unique journey. Join Cynthia Rose as she begins her unique perspective to all that is meaningful. Topics and personalities that support your path. Bringing inspiration and passion and heart-centered ways to live a more fulfilling life. A down-to-earth and uplifting sharing of what it means to be spiritual, creative, and living life to the fullest by standing in the sunlight. Born an intuitive medium, Cynthia Rose is also an ordained minister, singer, astrologer, educator, and writer. She has studied the intuitive and healing arts for over 40 years. Rise up and stand in your sunlight now with Cynthia Rose. Well, hello. Good afternoon where I am. Good morning. Good evening. Wherever you are in the world, welcome. I'm Cynthia Rose, and I'm happy to be here. If you are joining us live, wonderful. If you're listening on playback, welcome. Uh, just a couple of things. You can connect with me on Facebook under Cynthia Rose Medium. And we do have a Cynthia Rose Medium group page, which is connected to the show here. Uh, you'll find me on Instagram at Cynthia Rose Medium and Twitter at Cynthia Rose M-E-D. So you'll find me in all those places. And I would love it if you would click subscribe to my new YouTube channel, Cynthia Rose Medium, where you can see that I created a playlist for all of the shows to connect you easily to them and watch them when you want. All right. That being said today, um, we do have a guest today. We're just uh, not sure where where they are, but uh, we're going to be talking today about the Premonition Code, Julia Mossbridge. And um, I am Julia Mossbridge is a fellow at the Institute of Noetic Sciences, visiting scholar in the psychology department at Northwestern University, among other positions. She, she researches time Unconditional Love and Precognition. Website is www.mossbridgeinstitute.com. So just a little bit of uh, sharing while we're waiting to see if she is uh, con connect. Maybe she's having problems connecting. Um, as I read her book, The Premonition Code, there were also some wonderful um, notes here from Deepak Chopra, from James Van Prague. Um, I love this one, actually. Attention all truth seekers. Whether you're a skeptic or believer, you're in for an amazing journey. Read this important work and unlock the premonition code. And this is co-written with Julia, Dr. Julia Mossbridge and Teresa Chung. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about, so as I, and also there was a forward by Dean Radden on this. I think um, what I really loved about this book is that she was trying, has tried very much to present the facts. For those of you that may be um, more uh, scientific minded or wishing for the evidence, uh, you can uh, read this book and see that they're using the scientific model to prove um, intuition or, you know, there's, there's a thing about intuition and remote viewing. There's kind of a, there's a tie in there somewhere. But this is clearly um, from a scientific point of view. That being said, there is a point, and she does bring it up in this book, that we have to be open minded to what we see. And, you know, my experience is that when it comes right down to it, we have the knowledge to see all that is going on with us, but some of what we know intuitively is really hard to measure. Have you ever tried one of those tests where, you know, you or you have to choose which cards will come up, or, you know, they even have apps where you can choose uh, one, two, door number one, door number two, and door number three. Now, I've done okay on some of those, but I have to say, I think 
it limits my intuition in some way because there's a it can be so easy to be in uh, the analytical part of the mind instead of the knowing part of the mind. So it's really, those games are wonderful to play and yet we have to find the balance in our own self of where we go, are going into analyzing and when we're going into intuition. I do believe that we're in a time in history when Many, I see it all the time, many people, their intuition is opening up. They don't understand it. They're not sure what to do with it, how to work with it. So if you're interested in reading um, her book and also hearing about ways that they are trying to move um, premonition or precognition, how to move this forward, then this book might be some, full of some explanations for you. Sometimes we know something, we, we just don't realize it. Dreams are this way. Uh, I don't know if any of you have had a dream where you know something is happening and you wake up and you know it clear as day. But I know my own mother, um, woke. I woke up one morning, actually had a throat infection. I was home from school and I woke up and my mom was telling me that my sister was standing on a hill in North Vancouver and was calling her and that her car had broke down. She told me what was wrong with the car and went through a whole explanation. She said it was so clear. And about 20 minutes later, my sister called and she said, you know, I, I'm, uh, my car broke down and then my mom said, hold on, and told her everything. And my sister said, yes, that's true. It was all there. Did mom understand how she knew that? No, but it was clear as day. And she wished she could be there um, for her daughter in the dream. And she could feel her calling her. And I think that my sister, if I remember correctly, there was something about, uh, where are you? I need you. And she said, yeah, I did say that. She either thought it or she said it. That's what I'm not clear about. So there is uh, something, you know, when we, when we go to sleep, we have the freedom to access greater parts of ourselves that we might block off when we're awake. And so um, that can be a really powerful way to start to tune in to the fact that we are more than our linear mind. And we can take uh, like a pen and a paper by the bed with the intention of remembering it. But I will tell you that having an intention to remember them, I want to remember my dreams, is powerful. And also you can write down a question a question that you really want answered and then it may show up in your dreams and that can be a very powerful way of tuning in with your yourself and if there's any kind of disconnection with yourself if we're not feeling whole your dreams will certainly show this to you I'm thinking back to you know, back when 9-11 happened, in, if we go back into July, it was the end of July, early part of August, let me think now. I guess it was more like the first week of August, and I'm ballparking by other memories here. So I, I remember that it was like at least a month before it happened. So I don't remember the exact date. What I do remember is that the dream I had took me two weeks. I've never had a dream like this. It took me two weeks to calm myself. I woke up absolutely shaking. And I didn't make sense to me. I felt like I was in the start of a third world war and I was really upset. I mean, I literally was shaking. It took me two weeks to calm down. I've never had a dream like that in my life. It was so profound. And I wondered... You know, what? why am I having a dream like that? Now, I wasn't a news watcher per se, but I do think that 
in the bigger picture, somebody saw that this was happening and saw that I would be needed on that day. I was working with young people and that I would need to be at the top of my game on that day. Being as empathic as I am, I don't know that I would have had the strength to step into my game of, you know, being there and uh, strong for the kids if I had not had that dream. So I, it makes sense for me in my soul that I was being prepared to serve in a certain way to help out. Uh, now, did I know that it was that, will I say that I predicted that? No. I will not. That's not right to say. There were elements of it, an airport, there were elements of it that were uh, very, very accurate and strong. And then there were others like um, I had a piece in there from the Second World War that came up to let it was like letting me know my mind was interpreting that. So I think uh, I didn't know who to trust in the airport. Uh, it was it was profoundly earth shaking for me, earth shaking in a way that it was in the 90s. Uh, I had a difficult time being able to watch the news. My tears would stream down my face. I don't know if any of you have had this type of opening where you feel so emotional about everything that's going on, but I certainly went through that, and it seems like. For me personally, it was a passage. So, um, that is something really powerful about dreams. So, I'm wondering where our guest is. I'm having a hard time connecting. And uh, hopefully we'll hear from her. I'm really looking forward to talking to her. Um, maybe we'll hear from her after the break. So, um Back to that, I'm just saying there's many ways to, you know, work on premonitions. And, uh, oh, I do hear that our guest is here. Okay. Um, have I'm we so got sorry, Dr. Julia you. Mossbridge here? <laughs> Hello. Hello. Hi, I'm so well, sorry. I... My assistant put it down for the wrong time on the calendar. So I, I don't, you know, I oh. don't my calendar. And then I okay, saw well, I... Call. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're here now. We're glad you're here. I just shared some experiences of uh, premonition for myself and a little bit about the power of dreams and how that oh, can wonderful. come in. Not, so I, I just rambled about my own experiences. I had the feeling you'd be coming. So. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I'm glad your precognition was working well, and I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're glad you're here. Hi. So we've got about uh, four. Yeah, I'm glad you're here. So we've got about four minutes before a break. Um, okay, why don't we just start with a little bit about, you know, uh, how you came to write the book, The Premonition Code. I enjoyed reading it. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it, you know, it's a, it uh, took some guts um, Throughout my career in the last 10 years, I'm becoming more and more out of the closet as a, as a person who both studies the science of precognition and also is fairly precognitive myself. And uh, so writing the book for me, I mean, there's two authors of the book, myself and Teresa Chung. Teresa Chung has been writing books about new age and spirituality and stuff for years, but I... Um, I have never written about precognition and combined my own experiences with um, the science of precognition, which I've been studying since about 2006. So here, you know, I just decided I better do it, and it's scary and it's exciting. And the thing I love about it is that um, I'm asking other people like me who are sane people who have basically normal lives but who also have precognitive abilities, to come out of the closet and learn about the science of precognition and learn about their skills and train themselves, you know, using the website training that we provide for free or any other training that they find that they like better. Um, but, but really take it seriously because I think precognition is a skill that we sort of dance around the edges of because there's a little taboo about it, or I'd say a lot of taboo. Um, you know, people worry that it's, 
like something like being a witch or it's something like, um, it, you know, means that you're crazy. But in fact, if you use it responsibly and if you polish your skills and, and, and make sure that you stay sane, it can actually be a really important tool to help change the world in a positive direction. So that's, that's the motivation for the book. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I think there's so much superstition, uh, well, for me, about um, that knowing that we have. Uh, it's saved my life before. And so, I, I mean, I had had an experience where it saved my life when I was a teenager. And I, I just, um, I've gone through, though, I will say, growing up around those superstitions and thinking that they had meaning. So I understand that everybody maybe uh, clings to what they need to cling to. And maybe at some point we get to go free from that. But um, I, I mean, I, I don't feel like I have to do a certain thing to tap into it other than slow my mind. But I used to think there was other other things I had to do or, you know, I never had to do a dance or or chant or anything, but if that works, if that works for somebody to get them there, that's fine, right? <laughs> oh, that's right. And when, and, when, and when we talk about controlled precognition in the book, we take people through six steps. Now, some people have said to me, I only need one step, you know, and I say, great, don't do six, six steps, do one step. The, the point is, um, the point is you don't have to make it something that's scary or wrong or bad. And that's what I mean by witchcraft. I don't, I don't mean some of the positive associations people might have with witchcraft. What I mean are some of the negative associations that people have with anything that they don't totally understand. And so I, th I think it's really important to bring those things out into the world. Did you already tell your story of your precognition that saved your life? Um, I haven't told that one, no. Um, Do you want to? And um, I'd love to hear it. Well, and I have another one, too. I have one from a couple of years ago that um, I think he's going to cue us for a break in a second. So if we do, we'll we'll carry on after. But, um, sure, sure. yeah, I did, did, did. I was getting ready to head up. Oh, see, I knew it was coming. <laughs> so we're, we're here with Julia Mossford. Yeah, well, I knew because it's roughly the time, not because I knew because of precognition. <laughs> so, well, well. Go get a drink of water, everyone. We'll be back with Dr. Julia Mossbridge in just a couple of minutes. <laughs> Hi. Your conscious lifestyle on steroids. Om Times Radio. IOM FM. Om Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization, their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Connect at ohmtimes.com. Ohm Times, creating a more conscious lifestyle. Hello, I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, host of Ohm Times Magazine's flagship radio show, what is going on. My passion is sifting through information, research, and innovations from new thought teachers, speakers, and researchers, pushing back the boundaries of what we know about life, energy, metaphysics, and the universe. I love shifting perceptions about who we are, why we're here, and how quickly impossible becomes normal when we open our minds, expand our awareness, and accept that the only limits that exist are those we place upon ourselves. So if you're the kind of forward-thinking, eager investigator of what lies beyond the current reality that most perceive, why not make a date to come play with me in the field of possibilities at 4 p.m. Pacific Time, 7 p.m. Eastern Time every Thursday, and together we can discover what's really going on. Hi, this is recording artist and composer Yuval Ron inviting you to a voyage through the chakras, a new double album of guided meditations to transform your life, a sublime musical medicine for nourishing inner peace and reaching to your higher virtues. Get it now at metamindfulnessmusic.com, M-E-T-T-A, mindfulnessmusic.com. 
Some knowledge belongs to us and us alone. The way our girlfriends walk, talk, touch their hair. Details that only a sister can know about her girls. But what about our other girls? The ones we carry with us every day. Our bond with our sister girls gives life. But knowing your breasts can save it. Go to knowyourgirls.org for the facts you need on breast health. Brought to you by Susan G. Coleman and the Ad Council. All right, we're back with Julia Mossridge, and we're talking about, I was just about to share a precognition I had a few years ago. So um, I was heading up to Canada to record a, a CD. I'd spent two years writing with a musician. Uh, I wrote the lyrics and um, would meditate on his music. So I was very excited, and I was in my kitchen and I was looking for some gluten-free snacks that I could take. It's always a consideration with food sensitivity. So I'm looking around there. I'm really excited. And this sense comes over me like, oh, I'm not going to be here. Oh, and it was like, yeah, it was like this kind of dread, although I can't say it was my feelings. It was like this imposed upon me. And so I said, well, what's that about? And I felt, I heard actually, I heard accident. And I said, uh, should I cancel my trip? No, I should go. And so I actually said to the spirit world, I called on all the clan and the loved ones and said, keep him safe. I'm counting on you. I'm calling on you. Uh, I serve in this work. And I'm not going to serve if you take him. So, you know, whatever this is, I don't know. But And I didn't say anything because the way I was raised, you know, saying a ne negative thing happening is like, I think my father would have called it a self-fulfilling prophecy. You don't say that sort of thing. Right. So I didn't say anything. And uh, we were just about finished the CD. And uh, I was out for the evening. I was on a bus just about to get off the bus to meet up with my son and I get a phone call that there's been an accident and I just kind of went numb and uh but I went into action and and uh did whatever I had to do and we all we sent healing and um turned out where I was sending healing is right where he was hurt but I couldn't get any information because I was uh, because of FEMA or something. And so I was, you know, uh, not knowing anything that was going on for days. And yeah. so, yeah, so that was, it was really, that was, that was very intense. Uh, but what's even interesting after that, so that all happened. So wait, wait, and wait, then, is he okay? Uh, he is okay. Yes, he is okay. Yeah. Um, Sorry. But he <laughs> wasn't, he was, he, hurt. Yeah, he was he was injured, and so then I, I guess about six months later, I was talking to a medium friend, and I said, Do you know, he he would love a, if you feel like she said oh, I haven't done a reading lately. I said, well, if you want to do a a bit of a reading, I'm sure he would love a reading. Now she's never met him, she'd never seen him, and she said, oh, I think I am getting something. Okay. Oh, she said, you know, I just feel, are, are you Irish or something? She said to him, because there's a whole clan here and they want you to know they're here. Mm. They're saying, we're here for you. And I said, oh, well, I know exactly what that was because I had never said it before. And I had said, I'm calling on all the clan. <laughs> yeah, right, right, so right, right, right. there. So my research that I do is kind of like I put something out to the spirit world and then I watch it come back. So um, can't, can't really be quantified in the way you do it. But it was like I knew it's just like until I say that, they, I can't go any farther. I said, well, that's because um, I, I had to tell her after she said, oh, and somebody has been in an accident. I mean, she right away and they're here for you. And I said, yep, they're saying we held up our end of the deal and you're going to hold up yours. So, 
Well, so, you know, people often say to me, because I'm a scientist and I study this stuff, you know, they say their beautiful, compelling story like you just said, which is a beautiful, compelling story. And then they say, well, I, I don't research it like you do, but I, you know, I, I watch and I observe and I take notes. And I have to say that watching, observing, and taking note of what happens is absolutely a kind of first-person research. And it's like being a citizen scientist, right? You're observing these things and these synchronicities and these communications and these events that sort of seem anomalous according to the way we're taught to think about things. And those are really important because that's what makes scientists like me, besides my own experience, that's what makes scientists like me think, okay, there's something to this. This is a common, this precognition stuff, this is a common experience. This is something that is across cultures. This is something that is across generations. This is, when something's across cultures and across generations, you start to say, okay, this is probably not a fad. This is probably not some, you know, sort of psychological idea. When people used to go to seances and, and many of them were, were sort of fake and there would be like this ectoplasm stuff that would be produced via sort of tricky means, um, that, that was a fad and that went away. But actual mediumship is something that's been going on for thousands of years. So, so I think precognition is, is like, is, is something that is here to stay. And when you, of course, when I, I and others investigated it scientifically, there are certain forms of precognition that are very difficult to deny, even for scientists. And so I think it's, I, don't, I, just, I guess what I'm saying is when people sort of invalidate their experience by saying, well, it's not as amazing as science, I always sort of think, well, it's why scientists do what they do, so don't invalidate it, you know? It's important. Yeah, yeah, thank you for saying. I, I think it's, um, you know, my, my personal big world view um, may be like yours. I, I, I have felt that humanity has been trying to move forward and that this is this makes me think of my grade seven teacher that said we're not using all of our brains and right. if we could learn to use all of our brains it would be different and I think well if everybody lived with this knowledge that we're more than the what we consider the mind this way that we're more than what we are a carbon body then what a different world it would be but i feel collectively that's where we're trying to get anyways i agree and i think this is one of the steps and there's uh, there's other steps and i think each kind of group of people will find something that they feel comfortable with to help them get to that you know and, and so it may depend on your religious tradition your culture your language your family your politics who knows but there's, there's going to be something for everyone to get to the place of understanding the truth of our connectedness and of, of unconditional love. And I, I think precognition, practicing controlled precognition is one of those things. Now, that, that is not a scientific statement. That comes from my mystic part of me. But I'm learning to stop differentiating my scientists from my mystic because they seem pretty related. Yeah, there seems, I, I agree. There seems like there's something about, like, how we make it meaningful to us matters. Yeah. You know, I, I, I I'm, so. I'm, I'm amazed when, uh, like, I, I've had um, a man come through who is a minister who I'm sure his faith didn't involve mediumship by the way he was, but he was standing and showing me the church he built, that this was my, this is where I was. And then I have, I've had another faith. I've had, uh, different people of different faiths come through honoring the faith that they were um, and feeling like it worked for them. But they they are, they might not have been connected to this, you know, it might not. Some of them were and some of them weren't. And so to me, I always find that rather joyful to have someone come in and say, well, what I taught didn't encompass this, but here right. I am. Right. right. <laughs> Do you know? Right, right. right. There's a certain... <laughs> sense of um, freedom and a sense of look um, the, the realization is is love I mean that's the realization absolutely and that's kind of culturally independent and absolutely independent. so yeah so uh, let's but back to you know to talking about the book um, 
So do you want to tell maybe an, a precognitive experience you had or uh, something else about the book? What, what comes to your mind when I bring this up? Well, so what came to my mind is um, two stories. So one is the story that um, talks about a, a, a precognitive compulsion. You're, in your story about the accident, you got the word accident. And you, you knew then that there was, you had the content of the precognition was right there. There was going to be an accident, right? When I have waking yep. precognition, unless I'm sitting down to do my controlled precognition practice, which is a whole different thing we can talk about, but if I am just having a spontaneous waking precognition and I'm not dreaming, I generally don't have content like that or words or images. I have what, what I call a precognitive compulsion, and bunches of other people have talked with me about this, but it's... You don't know why, but you feel compelled to do something that feels at the time to be kind of ridiculous. But it turns out after you do it that there was a very important reason for you to do it. So one of the examples I talk about in the book is when my son was about 13, he used to ride his bike home from school. And he came in the door, and I was making dinner because he had some kind of after-school thing. And he came in the door, and I saw that he had put his bike away. And all of a sudden, I got really upset. And I, for no reason, I mean, I just, I was almost felt like my body was taken over. And I said, Joseph, which is his name, did you lock up the garage door after you put your bike in it? And he said, um, you know, I don't know, probably. <laughs> he, was, he was like, I'm, I'm tired, I want to have a snack, you know. And I said, you know, you have to, and I laid into him. You've got to be more responsible. We don't live in the best neighborhood. You have to lock up the garage door. It's, you know, it's an okay neighborhood, but still you should lock it up. And da, 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 da. And my uh, boyfriend, who is now my husband, but my boyfriend at the time was watching this unfold. And he was sick with a lung condition where he needed an oxygen machine. But even in between his breaths of oxygen, he took the time to say, Julia, if you feel so strongly about this, you should go check yourself. And I said, well, I will, because I can't get Joseph to do it. And when is he going to grow up? Blah, blah, blah. I, I was just horrible. There was no reason for me to behave this way, but I, I, I didn't know how to stop it. So I, I said, fine, I'll go check. And I went out to the garage, checked it. In fact, he had locked the door after all of me yelling at him. And I walked back into the house. I was still grumpy. And on the way back to the house, I saw that the electrical meter was on fire. And it was spreading. Wow. And on the, other, on, the, yeah, and on the other side of the wall of the electrical meter was my uh, boyfriend's oxygen tank. Ooh. So it would have been a big problem pretty soon with all the plastic tubing with ox oxygen in it. It would have been a big problem pretty soon if I hadn't, for some reason, gotten angry and gone out to check it myself. So that's one example of something I call a precognitive compulsion, which doesn't mean that every compulsion you have is precognitive or even worth paying attention to. I want to point that out. But certain ones pull at you and tug at you so mightily that they can really save your life. So that's an example of, of one. And the other one that comes that's, to mind. Sorry, go ahead. I apologize. No, that that's that's a pretty big one. That's uh, see, in my world, that's somebody in the spirit world looking out for you, putting it in your mind. But that's my belief system. <laughs> well, and it could and it could be, and it, and yet it's still precognitive, right? So before I yes, it on is. fire, right? So it, it can be the that's kind of like an explanation for the mechanism. But the fact of the situation is before I saw the fire, I felt like I had to go outside for some reason. So that's precognitive no matter how it works, right? Yeah. Um, and so a similar one is uh, Craig Hendricks, who's a friend of mine, was in the military, and, and he was sitting in his bunker and doing what he was supposed to be doing with some computer, and then he just felt an urge he had to get some iced tea. And he was sitting on a case of uh, cooled water. And he was like, that's ridiculous. I don't need iced tea. I'm sitting on water. I could just have water. And the iced tea desire kept, the ridiculous iced tea desire that he couldn't put out of his head kept growing and growing. So finally he said, fine. He got up to go to the other location where the iced tea was. And when he came back to his bunker, it was closed off because there had been a, a mortar fired right at his bunker um, while he was gone. So wow. he feels that that compulsion to get the iced tea, which felt ridiculous at the time, but would not let up, uh, saved him. 
So these wow. stories are actually very common among construction workers, among pilots, among military people, people who, who are still alive, who listen to their, their intuition. Uh, it's a very common experience, and, and many people can be grateful for this. And that's part of the yes. study. Yeah. Well, and I love that, 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 that that's being studied because there are more and more and more of it. I know I read um, the controlled studies on, like, on mediumship. And I think the hard part, the question that I have for you is how do we, um, I think I was talking in the beginning about, you know, if you if we were to go to one of those, like, choose four squares or, you know, door number one, two, or three, okay, I don't think I'm so good at that, and yet I know I, I did something like that recently and I did good, but that was a fluke, I think, when I'm put into a position where there's a limitation, uh, yeah. like, say, turning cards over and knowing the card. I could feel that it's red or black, but maybe getting the number, I may not, but, if I, but then I can just tune in and read someone's auric field. So why is that? Right. Why it's is it well that... Known. Yeah, why is it that those limitations make it seem to make it hard? It seems like it would make it easier, right? You have fewer choices, but in fact, it makes it harder. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah, and and I think it's because the so so two facts. One is, um, in the world of precognition research, it's well known that forced choice. Those are called forced choice tasks because you only you're forced to have a choice between you know one, two, three, four things. Um, are not great for helping people um, express if they have any innate talent. So it's already known. In terms of why there's lots of different opinions, we don't know why, but I'll tell you my opinion, is that the conscious mind loves to get involved and, and guess. And as soon as you change from a sort of receptive mode where you're receiving information about something to a more active, oh, it could be this or this or this, oh, and you start to analyze, oh, I think it's a circle, oh, okay, that's what it is, it's a mind. Um, all of the receptive stuff is very quiet and kind of disappears. So that's that's what I th I agree. I absolutely agree. That's yeah. what I think too. Yeah. Oh, and here we are. It's we're going to go for a short little break. Stretch your legs and we'll be back with Julia Mossbridge. <laughs> Free your mind with Ohm Times Radio, IOM FM. Ascending Hearts is no ordinary dating site, but a spiritual dating site with a purpose, to link you with your soulmate. We engineer the serendipity so you can trust that you will attune with someone that has the same matching vibration as you. Ascending Hearts, the conscious dating site for the spiritually aware. Try Ascending Hearts for free, ascendinghearts.com. Tune in to The Practical Intuitive, Mind, Body, Spirit for the Real World with me, host Robin Fritz, Mondays at 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 Eastern. I'll cover personal and business intuition, animal communication, mediumship, space clearing, past life regression, shamanic insights, energy healing, soul choice, and more, all to help you tap your own intuitive and healing skills. No ifs, ands, or buts. Hi, this is New Age Grammy winner Paul Avgerinos. Thanks for listening to Home Times Radio, and please support my peaceful healing music with a purchase at iTunes, Amazon, or wherever you shop for fine music. Just put my name into the search engine. Paul Avgerinos. A, V like Victor, G like George, E, R, I, N, O, S. You can also visit me at roundskymusic.com. Thanks for listening, and I'm wishing you the brightest of blessings.
GTG, BRB, OMW, be there in a few. You may think that these kinds of texts are fine because of their length, and you can easily send them at a stoplight. But no, answering one text can take your attention away from the road for five seconds. And traveling at 55 miles an hour, that's enough time to travel the length of a football field. Make good decisions. Don't text and drive. Visit StopTextStopRex.org. A message brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, Project Yellow Light, Noise, and the Ad Council. Okay, back, talking to Dr. Julia Mossbridge on her book, The Premonition Code. You know, I just thought of something um, about, you know, when I was a, a teenager, um, you know, I wrote a poem, uh, and I think it was, uh, I was out of town when I wrote this poem, and it just flowed right out of my hand onto paper, and when I read it, it freaked me out a little bit. I didn't know who it was about, but it was like they found her on the floor as they rushed through the door, and it was about somebody dying. And wow. uh, it, yeah, it really freaked me out. I didn't know what it was. Uh, and it was within a couple of weeks, uh, this happened in my life with somebody. They didn't die. They went into a coma, and I went and talked to them while they're in the coma, and said, because I was told at the hospital, you know, you can talk to them, and and I was like, please come back, please come back, and um, so I want to say the thing about precognition is sometimes it's scary. <laughs> Wait a minute, did the person come back? They did. They came out of their coma. Okay. I keep, like, being on the edge of my seat to not know whether these people are surviving. I'm so grateful. Okay, that's Yeah. Awesome. Um, yeah, they, so came out of, they came out of their coma. That's great. And what was the question? Yeah, I'm saying sometimes they, it's scary. People are afraid of, and I've had people say to me, oh, I wouldn't want to know. Now, I don't live in that fearful place anymore, but... When I go back when I was younger, these knowings or things, they were scary back then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. And I think and we have to switch to... I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. Just go, no, you go ahead. Well, I was saying, um, if a teacher saw that um, poem, you know, a teacher might think, wow, what's going on in your house, you know? Um, and they might... <laughs> Right? They might bring you in and say, is there some kind of drug use going on in your house or what's happening? You know, what's happening to you? Like, they might be concerned about it because we don't have um, teachers educated about, you know, that creativity often comes from the place of where, the, where, where precognition comes from. You know, we don't, that's not a, a known piece of information in the world of education or most of the world in general. And so there could have been a lot of judgment and concern, but in fact, it's as if the universe was preparing you for this event. See, and that's what I was just sharing before you came on, was that I had this dream about a month before 9-11, and I've never had a dream like it before or since. Uh, and I was shaking. I actually thought I was having a nervous breakdown. Um, I had laid down for an afternoon nap, and which is not common, and I laid down, and I just... I felt like I was in an airport. I didn't know who to trust. The Third World War had started. Um, wow. And I was, and I, I woke up and I was literally shaking. And I, you know, called my boyfriend and he said, go pet the rabbit and pet the dog and ground <laughs> yourself. And, and uh, I was like, it took me, like after two weeks, it would be like, you know, if you have an upsetting dream and a couple hours later, an hour later, you're better or something. It was two weeks later that I felt like I was kind of going, oh, I don't know what that was about. And I didn't watch the news, so I didn't know what was going on. Uh, and uh, so, but I believe that the morning that it happened, um, had I not been prepared for it, I wouldn't have been able to go and help the kids that I was teaching. And somehow I was able to go into gear and, and I had a couple of kids that were 
very empathic and very concerned about the people in New York and they were worried about them. And I said, well, do you have family there? No, but I'm very concerned about them. And yeah. one of those kids was known to be a bolter, you know, run. So, I mean, mm-hmm. I had to be strong for them um, in, a, in a different way. So, yeah. Yeah, the preparation aspect is really key. I mean, sometimes people say, why, why, you know, especially people who have lots of precognitive experiences say, well, why should I have these? I can't change anything, or I have the experience of not being able to change anything, although clearly sometimes there are things you can change. Um, and I say, well, you know, would you rather be prepared or unprepared? I mean, really, it's a whole different world when you have a mental preparation that something could happen. It's a very different yeah. experience. And yeah, see, I yeah. think that our, I believe that our higher minds see what's going on and it trickles down into our conscious mind. So, because I, I, I have a sense, well, I was like, oh, I knew that was going to be that way, but maybe I was doing the dishes and was like aware of it, but it wasn't like I was analyzing what I was hearing. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, in the book we talk about the higher self handshake because one of the, you know, when people want to try to get this stuff into a useful, sort of apply this stuff and harness it in, in a useful format in their lives um, when they want it, then they can we invite them into a controlled precognition practice. And part of that practice is creating what we call a higher self handshake, which is your super conscious or what people call your higher self agreeing to work on what it's good at doing and your conscious mind or self or ego agreeing to work on what it's good at doing and having a handshake about it so it says okay each of us has things that we're good at doing and we're each going to do the thing that we're good at doing but not trying to do the other one's job and i think that that is really important because the yeah. conscious mind can kind of go in there and say no i want to do your job i'll do the whole thing and then the higher self which is a quieter voice might say oh, all right <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And I I can relate to that from like when I'm reading, I'll get a certain amount of information and then I become aware that, you know what, I'll I'll say, you know, let me just hold on that because I don't want to go into my mind because I can feel another part of me wanting to come in and say, uh, I want to get more information on that say, no, no, we've got to let it just come. So it's so easy to go into the other place. Yeah, there's nothing like training your psychic ability to get you more aware of what your tendencies are. It's like getting to know yourself even deeper. Yeah. 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 So in looking that's, through that's the... What, that's why I think it's a beautiful practice, actually. That's why I think it's valuable. <laughs> so. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I, I, I don't know if that... I read the book and I don't remember. I know you talked a little bit about remote viewing, but... Um, how would you describe remote viewing versus psychic information? Do you want to comment yeah. on that? Yeah, I do. Sure. Um, so it's not really a versus, right? Psychic information is very broad. Remote viewing is like a subset of, of a way to get psychic information. It's a, it's a, it's a more uh, controlled sit down. Now I'm going to get psychic information type of process, right? It was developed by the military. Some, some people who teach remote viewing can be very technical about it. When I teach remote viewing, I'm, um, I bring in sort of more aspects of my own sense of mysticism and unconditional love and such. But it's still fairly technical because um, remote viewing, uh, or what I call controlled precognition, which is an even smaller subset of remote viewing where the target is not known until after you've completed your, your viewing. Um, Control precognition uh, is a chance to allow the universe to give you feedback about how good you're doing, or I should say how, how, how good your, your session is or how well you are doing in terms of accessing information about the future events. And the reason is there's some kind of target in the future, and the only way to get information about that target at a rate above chance is to tap into that target in the future. So it's not reading anyone else's mind, and it's not being clairvoyant. It's tapping into the target into the future. It's essentially reading your own mind 
in the future as you look at the target. So I think um, control precognition is probably the most constrained, one of the more constrained subsets of, of psychic functioning. There's a lot of different types of psychic functioning. And the reason I, I like control precognition is because you can't fool yourself into thinking that you did well when you didn't. There's an answer, and if you didn't get the answer, you did not do well. It's really nice because you can go off the rails um, when there's no clear answer, and you can decide you are omniscient and you can get delusional, and uh, I like to guard against that. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just find it fascinating, the, the whole... Uh, well, two things, the target not known. Um, I did read about uh, a lady that was a well-known remote viewer that they had, I mean, read about some of that and Russell Targ and you know, just heard, read about some of that and uh, how accurate, how they chose the target like after she had written it down and somebody else changed it and she got so good and... Um, then it starts making me wonder, well, what is time then? Is time, everything happening all at once and we just can't comprehend it? Maybe. And it's not clear how we would figure that out except mathematically. Um, so we need to remember that time is just like any other sense in a way. Like if you think of, of a sense of visible light, you know, it took a long time before physicists recognized that there were other forms of light that were not visible and that we were really constrained by our perceptual senses in terms of deciding what light was and that those senses were limited. And so I think the same can be true for things like time where you know, we, we perceive time in our everyday lives going in one direction for the most part. And that does not mean that in the physical world, events in time don't flow in both directions. It in fact means nothing about the physical world. It just means that the way it works to perceive it in humans, as far as we know, is to generally have a flow of time that goes in one direction, and that's all it means. So I think we have to remember that even with something as that seems so basic like time, we can be misinformed based on our consciousness and our and our perception. You know, and if you think about space that way, certainly we've learned a lot about space since people used to think there was such a thing as absolute space, and then we learned that space is relative. Einstein comes along, and, and, and everything depends on your reference frame. Well, so it turns out time is relative, too. The sense of now, of now is relative, according to a special theory of relativity. There is no sort of privileged moment at which we can say it is now. It all depends on your frame of reference. So I think we need to... Um, sort of get off our high horse that makes us think we know that there's some kind of absolute time and just let go of that since there's no good evidence for it and there's evidence against it, in fact. Yeah, and that's a very good point about different forms of light. And I've had that experience with, you know, with sound. Um, I, I trained as a singer years ago and I was lucky to train with a man named Dr. Jacob Ham and he had me um, working with a, you know, one of those old sound wheels. They would use them to tune pianos. So he had oh, perfect yeah. pitch. So so he'd say, here's 10 cents off, here's 10 cents flat, here's 10 cents sharp, and he'd have me working with it. And when we would get right on, he, he would demonstrate and he'd have me, there'd be this whirring sound, and he'd say, do you hear the overtones? Well... <laughs> At first, I was like, well, there's sort of a, a a bit of a feeling of ringing, and then it became I'm hearing a ringing, and of course, he was really good at creating the ringing. So um, I came to realize that I wasn't hearing everything. He was hearing, uh, he had, for one, he had perfect pitch, and he said most radios are 10 cents flat, so he couldn't listen. And um, so he was really tuned, it was really fascinating and he worked for years as a hypnotist so you know uh. yeah so it was really interesting he'd get you into this state and all of a sudden I'd be like okay and I'd be like oh I I, I started to hear differently by working with him yeah yeah yep. I mean yeah I did my uh, dissertation on uh, auditory training you can train the auditory system to hear very very fine differences in time and in 
space, which in the auditory system is also frequency. So yeah, those, those I mean, frankly, training, perceptual training works. <laughs> you know, adults can get better at this stuff too. You don't have to be a kid to improve. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not surprised by any of it, right? I'm surprised we yeah. only kids are, have brains that are plastic enough, but that's not true. Yeah, I can remember saying that years ago. Could it be that there's plasticity in in the brain to to in adults to a doctor? Because I felt like I'd retrain my brain and. And the doctor was open-minded enough to say, well, there's no evidence for it yet, but it's possible. And, of course, now there is. I'm just uh, I'm looking at the time here, and we've got just a couple of minutes. I want to make sure you uh, let we say your websites and how people can get in touch with you. Sure, um, sure. So um, the premonitioncode.com, mossbridgeinstitute.com. And at, at both of those, you can go to the Contact Us page, and you can send a note if you want. Uh, but the most important thing to try for fun is the positive precog training page where it will take you through as many precog sessions as you want for free and uh, to check that out. That's, that's the most important piece. The other important piece is I'm coming to New York of the uh, doing an event on October 30th uh, at the Ascension Church in New York City in Manhattan with Mitchell Rabin of A Better World TV. So people should know about that too. Okay, great. Well, it's been great to have you on. It went really quick. And, um, yeah, we'll have to have you back and um, make sure your assistant gets that time right. <laughs> but it was all fine. Yeah, it was all fine. So thank you so much for, for joining us. Have a great rest yeah, of your thank day. Thank you so much. Okay, you too. Okay. Take care. Okay, bye-bye. Okay,